Wow. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Luther College, and thank you for being here with us tonight. My name is Sam Astin, and I am a senior biology major here at Luther. Before welcoming Drs. Walensky and Osterholm to the stage, uh, we will open with a land acknowledgement. The land on which Luther College stands has been home to the Iowa, Sac, Fox, and Dakota people and their ancestors. As part of the neutral ground created by the United States government to control the movement, lives, and livelihood of native peoples, this land was home to the Winnebago Ho-Chunk during their forced displacement from Wisconsin. The dispossession of the Iowa, Sac, Fox, and Dakota, and the forced migration of the Winnebago Ho-Chunk people was motivated by the interests of settlers such as those who founded this town and this college. The Winnebago, during their residence here, addressed the land as grandmother. The tribe's orator, Wakan Decora, believed his people were extended the blessing of this place by the Great Spirit, saying, we did not make it, nor could we make it, so pretty and fair a land. Please honor this history and the ongoing connection of the descendants of these early residents to this place. Please also honor and care for the land, water, and resources as these residents did, like a loved and loving elder to whom we owe our life. Thank you. In just a moment, Dr. Osterholm will come out. Oh. Thank you. In a moment, Dr. Osterholm will come out and give a few words about the David J. Roseland Distinguished Lecture on Science and Leadership, and he will also introduce Dr. Wolenski. To welcome them, I simply wish to express how grateful and excited I am to be here and how wonderful opportunities like this are for Luther students, staff, faculty, and the greater community. As I said, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm sure you all are too. So please help me welcome them with a warm Luther College and Decorah, Iowa welcome. Great crowd. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, for that kind introduction and background information. Good evening, and welcome to the fifth Dr. David J. Roseland Distinguished Lecture on Science and Leadership. I'm Mike Ostrom, a 1975 graduate of Luther College and a former advisee of Dr. Doc Roseland. I'm now a Regents Professor and McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota and a member of the Luther College Board of Regents. The David J. Roseland Lecture on Science and Leadership honors Doc for his 36 years of distinguished service to Luther in the numerous roles as assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, all in biology, the dean of admissions and financial aid, vice president of the college advancement, executive vice president of the college, and finally as interim president. Doc devoted his entire career to his students and to Luther College. We are here to pay tribute to you, Doc, and by bringing together nationally leading scientists, policymakers, and experts to Luther to expose our students and our faculty, as well as the community, to the great science and policy issues and challenges we face today. Doc, while this special lectureship honors your legacy, the many hundreds of Luther students who lived through you have been delicately shaped by what you've done, advising them and providing endearing friendship. And by your example of true servant leadership, you are, and we will be, a living legacy that will thrive forever. Doc and Joy and your daughter Jennifer and John, can you please stand your acknowledgement? Yes, we realize that in life often comes from the support of family, and you, Doc, have had that incredible gift. Joy, Jennifer, and John, we honor you tonight, too. 
Thank you. Previous rules of lecturers, including internationally renowned journalist Ted Koppel, pioneer climate scientist James Hansen, Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank President Neil Kashkari, and in 2017, I had the honor to address our lack of preparedness for a future pandemic. What? <laughs> that didn't go so well. Before I introduce our special roles and lecture, I want to acknowledge the many individuals here at Luther who've helped make this evening possible. In fact, it was a team effort. President Ward had to leave for an engagement at Twin Cities tonight, but was with us throughout the afternoon. Provost Brad Chamberlain and other cabinet members are here. Could you please stand? I'd like to thank the faculty and staff of Luther College's Center for Ethics and Public Engagement, and particularly Andy Hageman, who has been the conductor of this event, and supported by Ian D Danielson, Avery Rage, and Rosanna Zion. Thank you. In addition, thank you to campus programming and the Luther College catering, as well as campus security for all your support and efforts with this. Tonight, we will deviate from the format of our first three lectures and instead have a fireside chat with our distinguished guests, much as we did with President Kashkari. I will pose a series of questions to Dr. Walensky for the first 45 minutes or so, and then we'll entertain questions from the audience, first from the students and faculty, and then members of the community. As you can see, there are microphones in the aisles for the questioners. Please identify yourself when asking the question. Without further ado, let me introduce our very, very special guest, Dr. Rochelle Lewinsky. Dr. Lewinsky served from 2021 to 2023 as the 19th director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Prior to that, she was a professor of medicine at Harvard, the Harvard Medical School and chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital. By the way, that division is considered among one of the most expert infectious disease groups in the entire world. Dr. Walensky's lifetime research is focused on infectious diseases and HIV AIDS. She has worked to improve HIV screening and care in South Africa, led critical health policy initiatives, and researched clinical trial design and evaluation in a variety of settings. She was chair of the Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council at the National Institutes of Health and has served as a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services panel on antiretroviral guidelines for adults and adolescents since 2011. Dr. Winsky served on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic in Massachusetts until beginning her tenure at the CDC on January 20th, 2021. While at CDC, Dr. Winsky led the nation and the world through unprecedented times navigating the darkest days of the COVID-19 pandemic and further facing the highest occurrence of new and re-emerging infectious disease threats likely seen in this country in the last 100 years. Dr. Winsky received her BA in biochemistry and molecular biology from Washington University in St. Louis, her MD from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and her Master's of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. She completed her medical residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and her Infectious Disease Fellowship in the Massachusetts General, Brigham's, and Women's Hospital Combined Program. She and her husband have three college-age sons, age 19, 21, and 24. Finally, let me say, as a colleague, Rochelle is one of the most dedicated, brilliant, and kind professionals that I've ever had the opportunity to work with in my almost 50 years at this business. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our very special guest, Dr. Rochelle Wolinsky. Thank you. So now come the questions. <laughs> you have to know that this is a bit of a tightrope walk for her because I did not share these questions ahead of time with her. And she trusted me enough to come out on this stage. <laughs> and I told, I told her this was a very informed, a very bright community, and any questions from the audience would be wonderfully uh, received. So, but let me just start at the beginning. 
This is kind of a personal, professional perspective of tonight. Tell us what it was like when you received the phone call asking if you wanted to be the CDC director in the Biden administration. And if you didn't say yes right away, who did you seek advice from before deciding? Um, first of all, let me just say thank you for the incredibly warm welcome I have had here um, at Luther College. Um, I do want to say thank you to Doc for um, being the recipient of my my ability to be here and for the wonderful invitation, um, because this is truly a treat. I so believe in paying forward and and that our next generation is going to be continuously better than ours. So I'm just happy to be a part of it. So thank you. Um, and of course, Mike, to you for that wonderful introduction and your wonderful friendship um, in the last... I, Mike and I did not know each other well until 2020, and um, your wisdom and counsel over the last three years has really been meaningful. It's, it is why, among the reasons I'm here tonight. Um, I uh, was minding my own business <laughs> um, in the middle of November, um, just soon after the election was called for Joe Biden. I was um, in my office at Mass General, um, and we things were busy. Um, our, our infectious disease staff and faculty were really busy during those periods of time. It was dark days of the pandemic. It was just before we had gotten word that the vaccine, um, how well the vaccine worked. Um, we had a morgue pa parked outside the hospital because our morgue was not big enough at the hospital. It was really dark. Um, and I went up to my chairman's office for a meeting. Um, keep in mind that most of America is now locked down, right? But um, we were all in the hospital. Um, and I went up to my chairman's office and I came back and there was a voicemail that Ron Flain had called. Um, and it was a 202 area code, the, the Washington DC area code. And uh, Ron Klain, I knew the name Ron Klain and I Googled it just to make sure I made the name Ron Klain. Um, and I then called my husband and I said, Ron Klain just called me. And um, he knows me well. So he said, don't say no. Whatever he says, don't say no. <laughs> so um, fortunately, I had called him first because I might well have said, oh, I don't know about this. Um, but I called Ron Klain back and he said, would you consider a job in this administration as the director of the CDC? Now I'm 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 raised in D.C., so I always anticipated. I mean, always I anticipated if he was calling about a job, it would have been in Washington D.C., where at least I had some roots. Um, I never expected a call about CDC, um, and so listening to my husband, I did not say no. I said I'll think about it, and I'm happy to learn more. Um, and so it began. I will say I also, you know, went, I didn't talk to a lot of people. I was kind of sworn to secrecy on the request because we were being vetted. But um, there were moments where I felt like I can't do this job. How could I, how could I possibly do the, the enormous job that this was? And then there were moments where I said, if somebody is calling you for help and they think you can help when people are dying at a pace of 3,000 a day, isn't that what you train for? So it was this balance of moments, like, I am not worthy, but how could you say no, but I am not worthy. <laughs> um, that's what those few weeks were like. So when did you finally decide, and what made you say yes? Um, you know, the vetting process is a really intense process. I actually did not tell my kids that um, I was being vetted. I was working constantly. It was the pandemic, and I was the head of infectious disease. I was working constantly. So they didn't even notice that I was being vetted and just working every night. Um, and my husband was actually being vetted as well, and we were kind of being vetted together. And, and there's an enormous amount of paperwork, an enormous amount of ethics and things that you have to produce and trips that you've been on and inter you know for the last 20 years and addresses you've lived and where did I live in college at, you know we, so there's an enormous amount of work that goes into the vetting process um, I really told almost no one but as as it started going and as it became clear you know well now we want you to talk to Vice President-elect Harris and now we want you to talk to President-elect Biden. I was like, oh, this seems to like be getting serious here. Yeah. Um, it started to be that, you know, I was clearly in at least the final few. Um, and after I talked to the President-elect, he asked if I would be willing to do it. But I was already down a path such that if I was going to be asked to do it, 
that the that my husband was behind me that we were gonna do this. So when you arrived at CDC, it was a year into the pandemic. What did you find in terms of the capacity of your agency to do the job that was needed? And then what was the morale like? Oh, um, it was a really hard time. So keep in mind, um, so I, you know, took the job an hour after the president was inaugurated. The CDC uh, director does not, at least did not get Senate confirmed. That has still, that has since changed. Um, but I was not needing to be Senate confirmed. So as soon as the president was inaugurated or was uh, sworn in, I was sworn in an hour later. Um, and I went and I rented an apartment and I went to buy a car and all these things in Atlanta. Um, and I showed up at CDC and they said, well, nobody's here. Um, and it was like, oh, there's that. Um, so the people were working in the lab and whatnot, but but people were really, the government really did not want people to come in. And if I came in, more and more people were going to come in. So it was this balance of I wanted to be there to be the leader and to be present as the leader. And yet when I came in, you know, a dozen people would show up to do my calendar and all sorts of things. Um, so it was this balance of trying to do both. The morale was, um, the morale was tough. So, and and part of the leadership that I had to convey was, trying to boost that morale when I couldn't be physically present and the people were not present. So as you know, the prior administration had posted things that CDC scientists hadn't done, had done things. We had to do a full review of the websites to sort of scrape what was really CDCs and what had not been CDCs. Um, I did one-on-one -on -one meetings with my center directors, several of whom said that when they go to the supermarket, they don't tell people they work at CDC. Um, my security, the, this prior CDC security team, uh, my security team had asked people to scrape off their parking stickers on their cars, um, because they were worried about vandalism in the community. That was the morale. That is what, um, people and they are really smart, dedicated civil servants whose job it was to get us out of the pandemic. Um, and so we really, and, and they had the scientific will and the willingness, even despite all of that, to work the hours. Everybody was dealing with the pandemic in their own lives too. The fear, their parents, their kids were home from school. Everybody was dealing with the same thing. And yet so many of these folks were working constantly um, and kind of being beaten up. Well, following up on that very point, I know most people in this audience do not understand what it's like to take a job out like CDC director during a pandemic. 20-hour days, seven days a week, and for months on end. Criticism from all circles, notably politicians and the media, and even death threats that require you to constantly wonder about your safety and that of your staff and even your own family. How did you get through these two years and yet maintain your focus and hope for the future? How did you do that? Um, so all of that is true. Like it was that that's kind of how it was. Um, I used to joke and we were talking about this earlier that if I if it if it was a Saturday and it, I wasn't showered by 7 a.m., I you know, there would be so many meetings that I likely was not going to get a shower. in. <laughs> so like they were it was busy. Um, I will say I have this gift and blessing of an incredible family. Um, my husband, uh, you know, I would leave for Atlanta on a Sunday. He would ship me groceries um, so that they arrived when I were using Instacart or something so that they would arrive when I arrived in my apartment. Um, and, uh, you know, we would have Zoom dinners. Um, my kids would ping me funny memes or um, crossword puzzle questions that I couldn't answer in the middle of a meeting. But it was really, um, they really kept me going. They really, really bolstered me. I tried hard to work out on the weekends because that's was really the only time it went. We had a rule that I, uh, I never looked at Twitter at nighttime because that was particularly nasty. Um, but, you know, those were, it was, it was a lot of little things. I had community members baking me cookies. Um, I had, I just had people doing really lovely things for me. And I will say, you know, a box of cookies or brownies of your favorite flavor, um, it doesn't sound like a lot, 
But when that morning your worst possible photo shows up above the fold with your neck veins popping out, um, that box of cookies means an awful lot. And so it, it really does. Um, and so, like, you con I did constantly feel, even if someone was trying to make me look bad or trying to make me second doubt a decision, that there was, like, my insular world, I felt loved. Well, if I could just add an editorial note, I got very used to understanding how she worked. And that was the fact that a text message from her was equally likely to come any one of 24 hours in the day. And there was no daytime predominance. There was no Sorry. ice 24 hour. <laughs> so, Rochelle, while we're not heading back to the darkest days of the pandemic as we experienced in 2020 through early 2023, COVID is still a major cause of serious illness, deaths, and even long COVID. For our most recent national data, as of October 21st, there were 16,186 weekly COVID hospitalizations. Let me repeat that, 16,186. And for the week of September 30th, the most recent data we have, there are 1,339 deaths, an average of 191 every day. And now we have a newly updated COVID vaccine that CDC recommends every one six months and older get vaccinated and those pre not previously vaccinated get fully up to date and those previously vaccinated then getting this new dose. Yet as of mid-October, just over 7% of adults and 2% of children have been vaccinated. More concerning, the number of people at increased risk of severe disease is lagging. Only one of five people aged 75 and older, and only 15% of those 65 to 74 have been vaccinated. Why are we failing to translate this public health information into action and protection? Well, um, first of all, it does, I, I'm, I was, I'm still shocked by the numbers and how low the numbers are. Um, I do think that there's exhaustion and people have tuned out and don't want to be talking about COVID anymore. They're allergic to talking about COVID. Um, the less we talk about it, and I'm, I'm actually constantly struck as to how many informed people that I speak to frequently where they say, oh, yeah, that new booster, should I get that? And you're like, wow, really? Yes, you should get it. So first, let me just say, if you haven't gotten your COVID vaccine or your flu vaccine this season, please go get it. Um, if you're over the age of 60, talk to somebody about getting an RSV vaccine too, please. So that's your public service message here. Um, and I will say that um, the more and more people who are not really afraid of what they saw in 2020. Now people see a lot of people getting COVID around and they're not getting sick. Um, and we do have a wall of protection, fortunately, from the last two and a half years. Um, but I have gotten my COVID vaccine and I do think that those who are at high risk of severe disease should absolutely get their COVID vaccine. I have gotten my kids COVID vaccinated. So I do, I think Part of it is, you know, one of the one statistic that people um, told me on average, this was earlier in the days of the pandemic, is people generally heard the message of get vaccinated 10 times in a week. That's how much we were out there. Um, and if it took that to get to 86 percent of the population or whatever it was back fully vaccinated, um, we are not getting that message 10 times a week out anymore. And so I do think that p the public is not hearing it as often. They're seeing more and more people not get as sick as often, and um, they're not staying informed um, for for probably on both sides. They're sick of reading it, and we're and not many as many people are saying it in the news. Well, in light of that previous question and your answer just now, I welcome your thoughts about what we in health and public health are missing in terms of messaging about COVID vaccines. Let me briefly summarize the results of two studies that say it all about both our ability and our inability to reduce serious COVID illness and death. In December 2022, the Commonwealth Fund, a private U.S. foundation whose purpose is to promote an improved health care system, published a study analyzing the impact of COVID vaccine. They found that in the two years since the first patient received a COVID vaccine, the country's vaccine program has presented at an estimated 18 million hospitalizations and more than 3 million deaths. The program saved the U.S. more than $4 trillion in medical costs. The second study, published in April 2023 by Harvard, Emory University, and the CDC, 
estimated that 232,000 deaths could have been avoided among unvaccinated individuals in the U.S. over 15 months from May 2021 through September 22. Let me just again state 232,000 deaths could have been prevented had these individuals been vaccinated. What should or even could we have done differently to promote COVID vaccination that would have made this picture look so different? In particular, in light of the fact of so much misinformation that's out there about what, in fact, the vaccines can and can't do and the misinformation about what they do that may harm you. Um, there are lots of different angles to this. First, let me just say this was the largest vaccine rollout in American history. So we, in two and a half years, two years, administered 670 million vaccines into arms. It was extraordinary what we did. We still had a lot to do, and those statistics, I think, prove it. Um, there, but we got, we got people who, would, who wanted to come to us. And then there were two kinds of other people. One is what we frequently called the movable middle. These were people who were willing to get vaccinated but needed a little more TLC, a little more time, a little more understanding. And then what I will call the refractory people who are, were actively undermining. There was no way, whatever it is that you could do, that you were going to, were going to be able to get that person vaccinated. And I would say that part is... Some of it, at least through active undermining of our efforts, intended, concerted undermining of what we were trying to do. The movable middle is hard because um, you don't necessarily know until you start listening why people haven't gotten vaccinated. And that is, um, you know, healthcare workers, pharmacists, community health workers having the information and going house to house, person to person to say, why did you decide not to? And that could be my community didn't want me to, I didn't have um, somebody I trusted, I couldn't get there, or my cousin got Guillain-Barre from a flu vaccine and I'm scared. And you have to, you know, tailor your message for each of those people. I want to also want to just sort of in the big picture, and this was one of my last academic papers I wrote before coming to CDC, um, we had the vaccine, the, the prior administration, say what you will, delivered us a, a vaccine in record time. And that came with an enormous blessing and a small curse. And that was, there was absolutely no effort during that period of time while all that science was happening was to educate America that we might have this vaccine and you should trust it even if it was fast. Why should you trust it? Because the science is standing on 10 years of science that got us there that fast. But the prior administration did no work on the implementation of a vaccine rollout, commu uh, communication, trust, platforms for that rollout. And, and that was entirely missing when I started. So one of the challenges that public health faced you and I both recognize it, is that we were accused of changing our facts throughout the course of the pandemic. Didn't get it right. And in fact, one of the challenges we all experienced was the variance of this virus kept changing. And as it did, it changed exactly how we know people get infected, but changed who would get infected and how many people would get infected. And this to me was one of the challenges that I think we failed in public health is to explain we don't know, but this is what we're doing to find out. You were among those who tried very hard to nuance the information. What challenges did you face in terms of trying to say this is a changing situation? This is what we know. This is what we don't know. And then trying to engender more trust because people felt like you were telling them the truth. Yeah, I mean, when I, the, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times when I first started, and that op-ed was, I promise you I will lead with the science. Um, as a scientist, the bubble over my head said, and that science will change and I will move with that. I should have articulated that in that op-ed. Um, and in retrospect, that was one thing that I really wished I had done. I would, I, I almost like to sort of bring the counterfactual, which is, if we hadn't changed, I mean, if you think about where things were and the signs that we knew in January of 2021 when I started, I had a responsibility to change because we'd learned so much along the way. And oh, by the way, we had Alpha and Delta and Omicron and on and on. 
Um, but we had a responsibility to change. That turned into bad actors saying that we were flip-flopping or always changing our mind because um, it was a way to make us look bad or incompetent or whatever it is. But but that was my responsibility. I took that responsibility really seriously. And um, of course, science moves and it moves quickly. Publications also come. And there was a real um, needle to thread. Publications came fast for, for publications, but slower than policy needed to move. And so what we really needed to do in the public health world was know when the science had changed, see it happen in one community, verify it in another community or three or four, and then make a public policy change when we had that new science, sometimes before the ink was dry on the publication. Um, but that was the speed we were <laughs> So we use you know, as a lesson in the first year of the pandemic, there were over 500,000 articles published on some aspect of COVID. Many of them were what we call preprints, things that have not been reviewed by our colleagues as terms of trying to make certain that they really were valid scientifically. We had hundreds and hundreds of new people in the journalism world who had never covered a health issue before, but now were brought in, much like covering a war. And in many instances, they didn't understand the difference between a virus and the moon. How do we deal with going forward the same situation? It's only going to continue. What, what, what do we need to do to be better prepared to handle that onslaught of information? Some which was critical, some which was important, some which was okay, and some was a disaster. Yeah, I think that that is actually probably one of the most important questions. So as a scientist, if I read a paper in the New England Journal, I, have, I know it's been vetted by the highest level of peer review. If I read the paper in Journal of My Mother, then I know it's probably had less of a review, right? Um, when somebody dumps a paper into a med archive, the preprint, it has had no peer review. Um, and some of those papers are really well written and some and really good science and really well, the statistics are good. And, and having one person who can read the science and the statistics and the design, that's, that's a lot to ask of everybody reading these. So when they're dumped on Med Archive, you don't have a way of vetting that. Is this a good paper? Was this soundly done? Um, this is not quite my area of expertise. And I think this is, this is going to be where we are for, for how science is. I vividly remember, now I've spent my career writing papers. That's what you do in academia. That's our currency. Um, and I remember, and I also spend my career like hoping one of those gets picked up by the New York Times every once in a while, right? Um, I remember when the first Med Archive paper was cited in the New York Times, and I was like, that paper hasn't even been peer reviewed. Um, and so I, it is the case that to move science faster, we benefited a lot from Med Archive, and a lot of not so great science ended up in the in the mainstream literature and. Um, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to tackle this problem, but we are going to have to tackle this problem. I will say peer review, it is possible to get some of these papers into the mainstream literature quickly. Um, but this Med Archive thing is important, but we have to figure out a, a way to vet it such that your polit political writer for a newspaper reading a Med Archive paper is not citing the wrong sign. And I think in terms of the audience here today, they would probably all agree that if someone who had an MD or a PhD behind their name is someone you should probably listen to more than somebody who doesn't. Yet you and I both understood that we had colleagues who were just as far off the mark with disinformation who had MDs or PhDs after their name. How do you actually, within the context of your own colleagues, try to ferret out those who are providing misinformation or disinformation versus those who are providing information. And <laughs> helping the public to understand an MD or a PhD does not guarantee you're getting the best scientific information. Right. And I will add sort of the corollary to that, and that is sometimes those really smart people also disagree, right? That's, that's reasonable, too. I, I will say one of the things that um, the gift of Mike Oster Osterholm in my world is that we didn't always agree um, and that we could, I could say, this is gray, what do you think? It is true that in science and in, and in scientific meetings, 
it's one of my favorite dialogues is the pro con of a debate where the science is not clear that pro con ended up on the nightly news right where you have reasonable people now i would say mike you and i know um who those people are who are carrying the mds and the missing disinformation but america does not necessarily and um, generally, it's people who are trained in the field. Um, I'll say the transplant surgeon um, probably has not spent his career, his or her career, working on, you know, these epidemiologic infectious disease issues. Um, but even that, that in and of itself is probably not a reasonable marker because there are some people who I vehemently disagree with who are epidemiologists. And, and um, so that one is hard. That one is really hard. I don't, I, I'm curious on your wisdom on that one because I don't know the answer. That's why we have you here tonight. <laughs> Let me change the focus a bit. Your early career focused on people living with HIV AIDS. Can you share with us how you landed on working with this community and share one or two stories from your early days that were most impactful to you with regard to HIV AIDS? Well, um, yeah, so I uh, was a medical student in 1991, and um, I remember walking into my first-year lecture hall, and everyone was pouring over the newspaper. Um, and what was the news? It was that Magic Johnson had announced that he had HIV. Um, a year later, uh, Arthur Ashe had announced that he had AIDS. Um, there is a fascinating story, if you ever want to read the difference between the two. Arthur Ashe soon died soon thereafter. He had died after um, receiving a blood transfusion probably a decade before um, during a, um, a, a bypass surgery. Magic Johnson was diagnosed very early, which is why he is still alive today. Um, and he uh, was diagnosed because the L.A. Lakers took an insurance policy out on him. And so they did an HIV test as part of that insurance policy as screen when we weren't screening at the time because we didn't have anything that we could do. So that's 1991. Um, by 1995, I'm an intern in inner city Baltimore um, at Johns Hopkins, and we admitted six, seven patients a night, and about five or six of them were dying of AIDS, or four or five of them were dying of AIDS every single night. It is all we saw. Um, no, uh, December of 1995, so internship goes from July to July, so about six months in, um, we were told that there was a new drug called sequinavir, and that was going to be the third drug of the cocktail. And we could finally tell people after six months of my internship that you might live with this thing. And um, it was 14 pills three times a day. And uh, it was a lot. Some you take with food, some you t don't take with food, some you take with water, some at bedtime, some in the morning. Um, but it was um, it was a new lifeline and incredible science that was that brought us there. And there was so much more science that was evolving every single day, almost like during COVID, not quite as fast as COVID, but almost. Um, so I was super interested in the science. The other thing that was happening was this very marginalized community was the community that needed it. A stigmatized community, a marginalized community. We in infectious disease know, I need to tell you that um, infectious diseases tend to hit, hit vulnerable and marginalized communities. I, I like to say COVID came to our shores from people who could cruise and be on airplanes and quickly went into marginalized communities. Um, so I, it had this social impact too that was really important to me to sit down at the patient's bedside and say this is you know what we can and what well, meet me where you are what can I do for you can you take these meds how do we talk to patients about um, their diagnosis so I was sold on being an infectious disease doc and I really wanted to see how this whole HIV thing was going to play out um, there were so many patient encounters that I can sort of even recall off the tip of my tongue. I remember one where you sit down on the bedside, this patient was admitted with pneumonia. Um, and uh, I said, you know, what's your biggest, what's, what's your biggest fear here? And she said, I came in with no clothes. I have no home. I, you know, I don't even have a place to go when I get out treating the whole patient. Like, am I going to be able to get her antibiotics? So the next day I came in and I brought her a few things from my closet so she could feel proud when she left. 
Um, and she left against medical advice that day wearing my sweater. <laughs> and I thought that wasn't exactly what I was going, what I was aiming for there. <laughs> so like sometimes we don't always know exactly how it's going to go. Um, certainly I remember patients who had maxed out on their credit cards because they thought they were going to die. Um, and then we said, good news and bad news. The good news is I've got meds for you. The bad news is you might have to pay off your credit card. <laughs> Um, but there were, there were, it was, it was fraught. You know, I remember, I remember, pa I mean, patients coming to clinic having been raped. I, I mean, just really, really difficult, difficult lives these folks led and that um, you were their lifeline to try and try and make it better for them. You spent a lot of time mentoring young women. One of the things you are greatly admired for by many colleagues. What are some of the lessons that you can share with that experience? Um get out of the way. These people are super smart. Um, and they, I always used to say, like, you just need to whiff in the right direction because they, they know what to do. They know the right thing. Um, it, it, it really is. Um, I always used to say, um, there's, a, there's a famous book of getting to yes. Um, and for a lot of young women, it's getting to no, telling, you know, is there something you can say that you won't do right now? Um, I always use the, the analogy of um, people say, I have no time. How do you do it? It's, you know, it's, there's too much to do. Um, and I, I just call it an embarrassment of riches, that we, we are lucky to be able to have all of these things, that there are um, always balls in the air. Just don't forget which ones are glass. So um, I will give you the story of, um, it was April 6th of 2021. So I had been in the job for about six weeks. And I was presenting on a state and territorial um, uh, health officer call um, at CDC. So I happened to be in Atlanta um, because remember, I was only there part time because nobody else was there. But I was in my office in Atlanta presenting on this call. I think it was like my second call that I was speaking in. And I had my whole script and I was doing the whole thing. And my phone rang and rang and rang and rang. Um, and it was my son, and he does not call like that. So I had this moment where I thought, I'm six weeks into this job, I'm given a talk, and my son clearly needs me. Um, and so I said, you know what, glass ball, sorry, I gotta go. And I was, just so I said that to the, my, what, the ASTO, I said, I think I have an emergency, I'll be right back. My son had been hit by a car, and he is fine. Um, and he said, should I get in the ambulance? <laughs> the answer was yes. <laughs> um, he, you know, I spoke him through it um, and he is fine. But, um, and you know what? I, I thought in that moment, I might lose my job over not taking this call. And I thought, well, if I lose my job because I care about my kid. Um, but those are the things that you really try and impart on on young people to say it's okay to sort of care about your family first, um, because Asta was still there when I got back. <laughs> yeah. So how are you leveraging your CDC experience to, in terms of your new endeavors that you're taking on right now? I get to be here. And <laughs> um, I, I, um, I don't know what my next chapter will be. I really don't. Um, I tend to not do things the easy way. So I will say that, um, I uh, finished my job on June 30th. I took a couple weeks and uh, hung out with my kids a little bit, um, traveled a little bit, and I knew once my kids left back for school and my husband was really fully ingrained back in his work that the fall would come and I better have a plan. Um, I got a phone call from the medical school and the School of Public Health back at Harvard and asked if I wanted to come back. And I thought, um, I spent my last three years dealing with lawyers. So I have a few things to say to some lawyers. <laughs> so um, I asked if I could have an appointment at a fellowship at the Harvard Law School, where I am completely a fish out of water. Um, but I just think that crossing disciplines is when magic happens, and that having docs talk to lawyers. I also have a fellowship that I'm doing right now at the Kennedy School, the Harvard School of Government, um, where just understanding sort of the different needs and the tensions and the challenges and the interface and the intersection is really critically important and that we don't do enough of that 
in medicine and in government and in law. And so I am teaching a law school class, which um, my family thinks is particularly funny. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know exactly what I'll do next, but I really am trying to lift my head up a little bit and cross disciplines. Thank you. Looking back at your CDC tenure, what surprised you most about the agency? Um, first of all, they're just, I mean, I wasn't surprised because I knew a handful of people there, but just like incredibly dedicated people. I, America knows CDC because of COVID, and I got to see um, people who will put themselves on the line for the health of others, whose names you will never know, right? Um, but EIS officers, uh, disease detectives that rappelled out of helicopters to drop test kits on cruise ships when they were in the middle of the sea. Um, people who would run in the way of, uh, you know, an Ebola outbreak in Mubende, Uganda, because um, that was their job. And they really do it selflessly. They do it without, without your knowing their name. Um, they do it at the expense of time with their family. And, and so it, it really is an agency full of those kinds of people. I will also say that um, the effector arm of CDC is local and state public health. And for CDC to be healthy, local and state public health need to be healthy. And local and state public health are not right now. They are frail. Um, our workforce is frail. Our laboratory systems are frail. Our data systems are frail. And for CDC to succeed, all of local and state public health need to succeed. Um, and they need that is a partnership in, in its truest sense of the word. Um, and so we need more investment in that. And I fear that in the wake of what the last three years have been, there is not a lot of appetite for more investment. The, the quote that I very much remember really ringing true to me is you can't throw a treasure chest on a sinking ship and expect the ship not to sink. There was a lot of money that was put in in real time, um, and that got us fortunately out of the pandemic, but it didn't help fix the infrastructure that needs fixing. So really in following up with that very answer, if given the opportunity, what would you tell Congress to change about how CDC operates so that the agency can be more successful, not only with the next pandemic, but in everyday public health? Yeah, I, this is, I've had the opportunity to do that. <laughs> um, so we did at the end, towards the end of my tenure, do a review at CDC on the things that CDC learned from this, like a real tough mirror in front of the agency to say, these are places that we did things well, and these are places that we really need to improve, and and um, our how our operations really need to improve for the next for the next time. That work is happening at CDC right now. There are several things in addition to resources. So I talked about the resources to scale up um, public health in both laboratory workforce and and data. Those resources are really necessary, and they're not yet there. But the other thing is that CDC, and if you read a lot of the acts and bills, have, has the responsibility to do things that it does not have the authority to do. So for example, um, we have the responsibility to be swift moving in the case of an outbreak, but sometimes we don't even get the data to know that that outbreak is happening. That data is reported voluntarily by 3,300 counties, 50 states, nine big cities, six, uh, t five territories, and 574 tribes. And they all come in voluntarily sometimes. Um, but it's CDC's job to know that it's happening and know that it happened the second after. The example, the quick example I like to give is MPOX. Fortunately, we were getting reports of MPOX, but our first case of MPOX was May 17th. Monkeypox was eighth, May 17th. In retrospect, we now know that the peak number of cases was August 1st. The public health emergency was declared on August 4th, three days after the peak number of cases, and that allowed us to negotiate with states to get the data, which then happened on September 1st. How could we possibly move quickly? We did, but, but how could we possibly move quickly with that kind of data? So before we move to the questions here from the audience, let me ask you one last sobering question. Imagine this group is your mother or your father, your brother or your sister, 
your sons, your husband, your best friends. What message would you want them to walk away with tonight in terms of what they can do for themselves, particularly as it relates to you know, infections like COVID? First of all, for, for my family, thank you for the gift of what you've done for me and for your community in the last three years. Um, second of all, for your own self, do get yourself vaccinated um, because you really it really will help. It really will help. Um, it is also respiratory virus season. So if you happen to get a respiratory virus around the same time you got your vaccine, it wasn't the vaccine that did it. <laughs> um, and then thirdly, um, just uh, maybe this is twofold. Stay informed. If you don't like your local or state government or your federal government, choose another place that's reliable to stay informed. That could be SIDREP. That could be, um, it could be a society, Infectious Disease Society of America. But pick your favorite place that is trusted and stay informed. Um, and then take care of each other. Because I do think that one of the things that was really missing in the last three years was a willingness and wantingness to care for other. Um, and I really think that that, as a society, is critically important. Thank you. Well, now we're going to hold up with the audience here. There are my, two microphones here, and I ask any of the students or faculty who first want to ask questions, please come up and uh, <laughs> identify yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. So the floor is open for questions. A unique opportunity. Here comes someone. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Demigleo. I'm a chemistry and global health student here at Luther and also uh, undergrad to grad student at the University of Iowa studying epidemiology. So my question for you is how did your uh, experience in medical school with uh, HIV and AIDS um, how did, yeah, how did your experience with that impact your uh, ability to deal with uh, the COVID pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. So I will tell you that um, one of maybe two pieces. One is um, when I was a fellow, an infectious disease fellow, um, a very bright social worker who I just love dearly, um, helped teach me how to give a new HIV diagnosis. Now, I'd done this a bunch of times as a resident, but when somebody has a new diagnosis of HIV or AIDS, how do you tell them and she said, you tell them your HIV test came back, you are infected with the HIV virus. And then she said, that is all you say until they speak next. Um, and that is a very long time, usually. Um, and because you don't know what is going through their mind is their most concerning thing. And you could talk for a very long time and not actually reach their most concerning question. Um, and so I learned that, and in the context of vaccines and vaccine hesitancy to say, you haven't gotten vaccinated, let's talk about it. What's your biggest concern? And get out the reason so that you can actually address that reason um, as you're thinking about next steps. The other thing I, I will say is um, I remember seeing my, one of my early COVID patients when I was on clinical service and I was, you know, I had read the CDC guidance a bajillion times. This was before I had been at CDC and we were talking about isolation and quarantine and I'm saying all the words and it just becomes clear to me that, you know, this person who lives in a multi-generational household with 10 people and, you know, two bedrooms, it's not going to happen. Right. So there was so much about like the vulnerable population that I learned in, in working with HIV infected persons that you really just had to sort of say, what can this person, you know, if, if this person can't do everything that you're recommending, can this person do anything that you're recommending? And what is the most important thing that you can recommend given the hardships that they have to face? Thank you. Next question. We'll take one right over here. Yep. With this microphone. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks again for being here. My name is Ellie Gardner. I am a bio major junior here at Luther. Um, I feel like the it's well known that the uh, COVID pandemic uh, impacted minority and um, uh, less privileged communities at a disproportionately high rate. I was wondering what policies um, you felt were accomplished really well to address 
the gap in both like vaccines and access and understanding and what you would do differently in the next pandemic? Um, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so we were seeing that as soon as I got into the administration. One of the first things that I did, and this gets to the morale issue, um, on early April of 2021, it was about 10 weeks after I'd gotten to CDC, we declared racism a serious public health threat. Um, and that was something that was critically important to the morale of the agency. That wasn't uh, the reason that I did it is because it was the right thing to do, and because we were actively involved in trying to get vaccine out at a time where vaccine was scarce to underserved communities. Um, so what we did in declaring racism a per serious public health threat was I asked every single division in the agency. Um, to think about what the mission of their division was and to not necessarily only document the problem of um, disparities in health, because we know every time we look, we find it, but figure out an implementable solution so that we could address some of those disparities in health. And every single piece of the agency, we worked on full late supplementation in, in Indian country. And, and every piece of the agency was really focused on that. And that gave them sort of a mission and vision of how we could make it better. We were also, at the time, rolling out vaccine. And as we were rolling out vaccine, CDC has a metric called the Social Vulnerability Index, or SVI. And we said those big mass vaccination sites where we were doing 10,000 a day, um, we were planting those only in the highest places of SVI. So we were looking around the country and say, okay, where were the places that couldn't we otherwise couldn't reach people um, and that may have the hardest time in getting to people, we're putting vaccine there. So there was a lot of effort that we did um, in all of those vaccine rollout <laughs> community um, to do that. I think I remember being in Dalton, Georgia. Dalton is um, Northwest Georgia. It happens to be Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. She's not a big fan of mine. Um, and um, there was not, there was a lot of, um, I, I went to visit that district and I talked to them about getting vaccinated. And um, I vividly remember a story that they were telling me about how, it's a very heavily Hispanic population. And they said, um, and this was a time that vaccines were not even, the kids were not even eligible for them yet. And they said, if you want to get to elderly Hispanic population, you have to target TikTok for Hispanic youth. And I was like, well, that's interesting. <laughs> that's not where we were looking right now. But it was um, a language difference and a digital divide difference. And the only way to get to elderly Hispanic population in that community was TikTok for the youth. And so it really, some of this is community by community. And, um, and these were the lessons that we learned, but we continued to learn them so that we could deliver. Thank you. Yes, sir. Next. As, as a faculty member, I always yield first to students. Could you identify yourself first, sir? Uwe Rudolph. Thank you. Are you a student? Please go first. Oh. Uh, my name's Alice. I'm a sophomore nursing major. Um, and my question is, like, looking to the future, what factors in our society could cause mutation of current viruses or pathogens and development of new ones? And, like, how should we prepare for that? Oh, wow. I'm sitting here with an epidemiologist. <laughs> but, you know, I think um, we do know that there's evolutionary pressure, and some of that pressure is related to our use of vaccines or our use of therapeutics. There is an underlying concern that some of our use of therapeutics from COVID specifically will lead to many of our viruses require more than one drug to treat at once. We are only using Paxlovid generally now or remdesivir if you're in the hospital. And I think there has been this ongoing concern that there will be evolutionary pressure from the use of a single agent. Um, it is also the case that those drugs tend to work best on, and vaccines tend to work best on more invasive, more severe disease. And we haven't really tackled what's happening in the mucosa and less severe disease. So all of those things I think could potentially contribute. Um, and we continue, I mean, the best way to not have evolutionary pressure is to have less and less transmission we haven't not cracked that nut yet. We have. We still have a lot of transmission happening. Thank you, Uwe. You you qualify as faculty. Come right. <laughs> come on. 
Are you a student? <laughs> okay, my name is Maggie. I'm a sophomore psychology major. I was wondering, what is your response to people who neglect their personal responsibility to keep their community safe in the name of individual freedom and agency? Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I do think, and, and I tried to do this, I, I was in front of Congress 17 times um, in 28 months. Um, I do think personal relationships matter. It is harder for somebody to be adamantly against you when they know you. And so I do think um, picking up, if, if there was somebody who was, you know, personally giving me a hard time, part of the, what I would do is pick up the phone and say, hey, let's have a, like, we can agree to disagree. Like, let's have a conversation. Talk to me about where you are. I want you to hear where I am. Can we get closer to the middle here? Um, again, this, are we gonna, are we at a movable middle or are we, I'm going to not believe you, not listen to you, not trust you. Um, that is really hard to get through the door, but I, I do believe that those relationships matter. And, and even if we can agree to disagree, the dialogue matters. Um, and maybe, you know, I can understand a little bit where you're coming from. You can understand a little bit where I'm coming from and that, that will help. Thank you. Now we'll try it. We'll go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful presentation. I wish we had a few more hours to listen. <laughs> My question is, I have a twofold question, a medical question. RVS? RSV? RSV, I always confuse them. Yep. Uh, I went to my doctor two days ago and thought, I'm going to get the shot because I believe in vaccination. And he said, well, you probably shouldn't get it yet. And I was surprised at that. A, I, I also was concerned that if I got the shot, I would be taking medicine away from children. And I understand there's a shortage. So my question to you would be, what do you guys, do you agree on this or not? Can I, can I make a comment first? Because I think this is the example I was talking about earlier. Who do you trust and why? And I'm not suggesting for a moment this is misinformation or disinformation, but to stay current sometimes is hard, and I'll hand that back to you. So I'm not going to give you personal medical advice in front of this. No. Uh, but what, here, here are a few things that I will say. That the vaccine, I'm, I'm just going to postulate that you're, you're eligible for the vac then you're eligible for that vaccine not because you're under eight months old, but because you are over sixty. Um, the two vaccines are different. And so you would, by getting vaccinated yourself, you would not be taking any vaccine away from an infant. Um, they, the vaccine that they would give you is not the same one that they would give an infant. So you can, you can rest assured on that. Um, I will tell you that I recommended the RSV vaccine for my own 80-year-old parents um, and um, who are otherwise pretty healthy and well. Um, there is still, it's a new vaccine. Um, we have seen risks of things rare risks of things like Guillain-Barre syndrome, which we also see a, on rare occasion with influenza. Um, but for the most part, I would generally recommend it. Thank you. And just to follow up, if I may, I followed doc, Dr. Fauci for many years, 20 some years ago, he gave a presentation similar to this. And I was dismayed at the incredible attacks on him and the CDC and I'm wondering whether he gave you any advice. Do, do you interact with him at all? Or? <laughs> I saw Tony on Thursday. <laughs> um, he, I, I think he's the reason I ended up in this job. <laughs> um, and he has been a remarkable mentor and friend. Um, and yes, um, it seems rather unfair that someone who has dedicated his life to public service um, would be in a position where uh, he is not revered for the work that he has done. I think he is generally revered for the work that he has done, but he should not be, in, at least in my point of view, taking the heat that he has been taking. If I could just follow up on that just a moment, because Rochelle, I don't think, will go into detail, which I'm not sure she should about threats. But let me tell you, if you want to find it difficult to do your job, threats become more than you could, I can ever tell you in terms of influencing you. You know, I have received a number of threats, serious threats, death threats, and none of them actually hit home. 
until I got one one day that said basically shut the F up or I know where your daughter works. I know where your kids go to school, your grandkids go to school. And suddenly it took on a whole new dimension. This isn't about me anymore. This is about am I putting other people's lives at risk because of what I'm doing. And I think that that you and I both know how painful that has been. And Tony still has a security detail because of literally imminent threats to one's life. And, you know, you, when you do your job, you're doing it because you really care about what happens to people and why it happens to people. And to have it turn like that on you, I can't begin to tell you how painful and sometimes how lonely that can be, but you still got to do your job. And I want to say that because Rochelle has been a model for that. She has received so much, so much in the way of really difficult, dangerous uh, messages, et cetera. And I never saw her once for a moment ever back off of doing her job. And if there was ever bravery or courage, yeah, I'm going to say she was in. Uh, the end. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for your presence today. Uh, my name is Mansour. I'm a freshman from Nigeria, studying uh, data science and international studies here at Luther. Um, can you comment on the degree and intensity of politicization of public health, especially by elected officials in Washington uh, in recent years? And what dangers do you think that might pose to uh, the continuing readiness and effectiveness of institutions like the CDC and the NIH to uh, future public health emergencies? Yeah, thank you for that. But so I, it's a health job. And in fact, I, I, I used to come from the bedside, right? Nobody questioned your politics when you're at a bedside at eight o'clock at night and, and treating a patient. And so you take that same ethos and you bring it to the country. And then all of a sudden people are questioning your politics and your policies. And you, you bring the same expertise and the same, and the same commitment as you do at the bedside. So I, I think it's dangerous. I think it's not a good place to be. That said, I do, I did learn a really important, I like I knew it, but I, it really solidified for me. And that is, um, we can call it politics or call it what we want, but health is not the most important thing to everyone. And so as we talk about policies, little p policies, we do have to recognize that there are other things that are important to people, whether it is the economy or whether it is their education or whether it is transportation. Um, it really rings true as we talk about, and I spoke a little bit about this earlier, about school guidance, and it is my least favorite subject. But when you think about school guidance and you recognize that not everybody is willing to, there are some parents who would say, my kid is immunocompromised and therefore I really want no risk in the schools. There are other parents who might say, my kid is not going to go to college unless this school is open and he can prove on the football field that he can get a football scholarship. Otherwise, he's not going to college. And that brings a different import to making sure the school is open or that I'm not going to be able to have my job unless I can um, get my kid to school. And we have housing insecurity if I can't keep my job. And so you, we do have to recognize in the politics of health that there are other really important views at the table and the really important ones to hear. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Bernie. I am a psychology major um, here, and I'm coming with a perspective that is not like found in the U.S. I am from Haiti. And um, Haiti is a country where the healthcare is not the best and it has, we don't have accessibility as in the US. And especially when it was time of COVID because our country were most in lockdown and most of hospital were closed. And um, we relied more on indigenous medicine and, and homemade medicine to help in case we have symptoms. And we do not really get um, tested if we have COVID or not. Um, I wanted to ask two questions regarding that. The first one is how can you convince someone that is that does not even believe in healthcare to come and take the vaccine that they also do not believe 
it is efficace. The second question is how do you think the scientists um, or researcher can approach and try to incorporate homemade medicine or indigenous medicine as part of um, the uh, other cure that or maybe things that can help us against like viral infection or other um, sickness? Um, thank you for that question. First, I hope you and your family are all safe. I know Haiti has had some some hard times. We CDC has an office in Haiti, um, and I spent a lot of time with that country director because I know it has been difficult times. I will say that um, one of the things, CDC has offices in 60 different countries, and one of the things that's really critically important as we work in those countries is not just that, you know, the Atlanta team descends down on on wherever that country may be, but that we employ locally employed staff, we call them LES, so that we can really be culturally competent. Um, and, and also, in an ideal world, put ourselves out of a job, because what we really want to do is work with in-country and, and locally competent staff to train up and s develop skills um, so that you all can do the work without us one day, and that would be the vision and the hope. Um, in that partnership, I think it's really critically important to really understand what everybody is bringing to the table in terms of what, what does the community need? What does the community need from us? This is not going to be, in an ideal world, in the long term, it is not, you know, CDC comes in and says gets vaccinated, just trust us. What it is is a long relationship with health and public health that is developed over time that is developed in the community so that you have a trusted relationship in blood pressure and in sodium intake and in cardiovascular disease prevention and diabetes prevention and nutrition so that when that next vaccine comes, you go to that person who has had a long history there and that's a trusted person and a trusted source. That I think is the long-term view. We're not there yet. Thank you. Go ahead, student. If anybody from the community wants to ask a question, now's the time to get in line. Go ahead. Good Thank evening. Um, my name is Sonnet Munge. I am a junior global health major. Um, firstly, thank you for your time, Ken. Um, I was wondering if you would give us some insight into um, your departure from the CDC and just like put us in your shoes regarding um, your motivations for leaving, um, what that was like, um, particularly like media reception around that? Um, good question. <laughs> I, um, I saw my job as to get us out of dark days of a pandemic and to raise the morale of CDC and to put a mirror up to CDC and say, these are some of the things that we needed to do for um, the next pandemic and th things we need to do to improve. I also saw, I, I am an action-driven person. I like to do things, I like to, and, and I had, we're seeing some writing on the walls that in election season, action is hard. And so, um, and I had set forth a path for all the things that I thought needed to be changed, needed to be worked on, and that a lot of that work was going to take decades. We are not going to bolster the public health infrastructure in this country in a four-year horizon. It's going to be a decade horizon and a decade commitment. Um, and given that I felt like I fulfilled most of the tasks at hand, I thought it was time. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. My name is Gene Sumdahl. I'm, I'm retired. Uh, I was in the technical field. I'm very interested in systems of all kinds. Now, I was very glad to hear that you've been doing or that you've done uh, a, essentially a lessons learned analysis. Uh, in a systems field, we sometimes call that a post-mortem. Yeah, we didn't want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, which is really inappropriate here. <laughs> But we thought about it. <laughs> yeah. But okay, you have learned a lot. Suppose you had had that knowledge before COVID. What would you have put in the systems that you had there that were missing? Well, maybe I'll tell you the big five things that I thought were missing that we are actively working on. First was um, CDC is 
is was a research and academic organization that does a lot of really great research. They were moving at the pace of regular research and we need to move at the pace of public health that was changing quickly. And so one of the things I felt really strongly about is that we needed to get our science out faster. We were first in the world to publish, or to not even to publish, to report on how the Genios vaccine worked in MPOX. I had seen a year's worth of being the last to report on how the COVID vaccine worked. And I wanted to say, the second that a shot goes in an arm, somebody's gonna ask, did it work? And so we really needed to have the systems in place to report on that. So moving our science and data faster, translating that science into, um, into guidance that America could understand. If you read the guidance from the first day I started to the guidance the last day that, you know, our, toward the end of my tenure, there's a big shift in how it reads. It reads, um, you know, if you can do this, then do this. If you can't do this, then do this. Um, and, and it also reads in a language that America can understand. People didn't know what CDC was. Nobody was reading CDC guidance in 2017. Um, but all of a sudden in 2022, everybody was coming to us for guidance. So it needed to be digestible. Um, communicating in a way that all of America can understand partnering with local state public health. I don't think we were very good partners through all of our through all of our many years um, and that we really needed to be listening and trusting of our latent uh, state local health departments. And then finally, um, having a workforce that is ready to respond. Um, see, I was just saying earlier, CDC is essentially the FEMA of public health. Um, when there's an emergency, CDC has to be there to respond. And we have been. When there's a foodborne outbreak, a dozen people show up and, and address the outbreak. When there's a train derailment, a dozen people show up. During COVID-19, we had 2,500 people in the response at any given time. Um, and what happened was people could only tag out when somebody else was ready to tag in. And you can imagine... People were working a lot and hard, and it was hard to find people to tag out and tag in. But we needed the agency to have an understanding that if you work for this agency, you were working for a response-based agency, and you may not always need to be in response mode, but sometimes you might. So those were a lot of the lessons that we've learned and a lot of the work that we are doing in implementing, or the, the agency I believe is now doing in implementing, so we're ready for the next one. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Go ahead. Jody, do you want to go ahead? Hi, my name is Jody Eno Spurlock. I am in the biology department here. Thank you for being here. I teach microbiology, which has been its own experience in the middle of a pandemic. Once in a lifetime, I don't want to say opportunity, but um <laughs> yeah. Two, gift, two questions. I've really appreciated your attention to equity um, tonight. It's clear that that's a concern of yours. And across my email inbox this week came Medscape physician female compensation report this week, which revealed a 30% higher salary for male physicians relative to females like $86,000 a year, a cumulative being $2 million difference in net worth. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that in terms of closing that gap. Um, and then the second question is about at least what I have viewed as a, not a, as much of attention getting as COVID, but a version of a epidemic pandemic in antibiotic resistance, which is 3 million cases a year and 35,000 deaths, and is going nowhere but up. And there is, I predict, not going to be a vaccine saving that situation. And as I'm sure you know, the pipelines in R&D have dried up a long time ago. It's the focus of my entire lab in the in, in micro, so I'm curious as to what you might suggest for strategies or what you see as the future vision for that problem. So two separate things. Um, two big things. My enthusiasm is only because I get to talk about it, not because it's not a big problem. Um, so maybe I'll just start on the, on the 
female conversation. Um, it is also the case, and I've been involved in studies, I was on the Joint Committee on the Status of Women at the Harvard Medical School for a long while. Women ask for less in the way of grants. If you'd like to grant for grant for men, women ask actually for less money, women ask for less salary. The first thing I did when I became chief of ID was to try and look at the differences in salary so to, to make sure that we were equi equitable across the division. It is hard because women are more likely to step off an academic ladder for some period of time and women are more likely to take time off. So you have to correct for some of that. Um, but women always ask for less. And so at least in my mentoring, a lot of what I've been doing is to sort of say, push the bar, open the books, let's show the, um, let's be transparent about it. Um, and ask the questions, and don't be afraid. Um, I, have, I have been in situations in where I have perhaps asked for too much. The other thing I would say is um, ask a mentor. It, it's, it's easy for somebody to advocate for it, more easy, easier for somebody to advocate for you than for you to advocate for yourself. It's also easier for somebody to tell you you've asked for too much, um, I had gone to people as I was negotiating and said, I was negotiating, had 10 things on the list, and I said no to all of them. I was like, is that really no to all of them? And they're like, well, oh, you can push back on six, but not five, and you can push back on seven, but not eight. And so if you, if you find somebody in a leadership position who can help you navigate that, because some of them really are hard no's, and if you push back on them, well, it's not going to get anywhere. So I do really think that we need to have, and they don't need to be women. You know, to all demographics to help you out in that regard. But you ask somebody who is your senior who's seen that to be able to help put, help you push back and see where you can push back. Um, Antimicrobial resistance is a huge problem. It was what was on everybody's mind the day before we heard the word COVID or SARS or whatever it was. It was the first word we heard. And we haven't heard much about it since. There are, I think, 1,300 oncological agents, cancer agents, in clinical trials right now. There are 27 antibiotics. And all of those oncologic agents are going to knock out your immune system and you're going to need those antibiotics. Um, it is a huge problem. We have a surge in syphilis like we haven't seen since the 90s, and we don't have penicillin. Um, the maker of penicillin, I'm just going to say, is doing really well because it's Pfizer. And it's the only place that gives us penicillin, but we don't have it. So we really, uh, there's a shortage right now. One of the things, um, I looked at this just before I left Mass General, we went to the CDC at our antibiotic use. Our first year of COVID, we used more antibiotics in Mass General than we had in its history. And that is because everybody came in with a fever and pneumonia. And so they all got antibiotics. And so we had made some really hard gains in the prior 10 years in antibiotic resistance and hospital acquired infection, and we lost a lot of that just in three years. Um, we, this is a huge problem that we have to refocus our attention on because, um, and, and, and because pharma is not going to help us. Um, if you are an infectious disease doc in any hospital, you spend more time taking people off the antibiotics than you put them on the antibiotic release. Um, because we really need to restrict antibiotic use to save them. That is not a money-making strategy for a pharmaceutical who wants to use more and more of them. Um, so this is a tough push-pull that we haven't figured out, but we have a lot of work to do so, and we need congressional help to do so, to incentivize and um, bring these patterns and the of development. Thank you. One yeah, my name is Rachel, I'm a community member. And um, during, I have a friend who during COVID was um, working in Minneapolis in a school. And one of the things that she talked about, she worked with a school that had a really heavily um, first generation immigrant population, was that people weren't vaccine hesitant because of misinformation. It was because they wanted their kids to just be able to get vaccinated at school. One end to have that really accessible and really available in a place that their kids already were. Similarly, when I've talked to people about this most recent booster, a lot of people are concerned about insurance coverage, about waiting to get the shot. So my question for you, given what you've so eloquently said about marginalized communities being hit hardest, about racism, about access, is in this like 
next chapter as we think forward in terms of interdisciplinary work and collaborations you'd like to see, what changes would you like to see in the healthcare system to get at some of those, those bigger issues of access availability and to help folks that aren't hesitant because of misinformation but because of other barriers? Um, well, help that, thank you for that question. Healthcare access in general is a big problem. One of the things I've been talking about, because I think this is really important, not just for kids, there are, there is a, an incredible program since 1996 in this country called Vaccines for Children, and it is a program that allows any child who is uninsured or underinsured to get any um, rec CDC recommended vaccine. There is no similar program in adults. We have 14 recommended vaccines for adults, and there is no program to cover the uninsured. So that means if you're between the ages of 18 and 65, and you're one of the 23 million people who is not insured, you do not have access to CDC recommended vaccines. And that is not good for you, and it is not good for your community, because these are transmissible infections. Um, one of the things that was in the President's 23 budget and the President's 22 budget was to fix that, a Vaccines for Adults program. We still don't have it. And so um, right now for COVID, there is a bridge program through 2024 that you can get your COVID vaccine for free, even if you are uninsured. There is not a parallel program for flu. So if you are uninsured, and this is totally sideways, but if you are uninsured, you can get your COVID vaccine, but not your flu vaccine right now. And that has to be fixed. Well, it's, thank you. It's 8.30, uh, time is up. I just want to close a couple of comments. First of all, again, I want to thank you for college for allowing us to do this honor for Dr. Doc. Doc, thank you again. We're here because of you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.